smoking over here! Yeah! Ah! Got it! Snap! Alpha team is warm, out of control, receiving. The blaze is rapidly spreading from wooden chairs to nearby timber in a room that also contains flammable chemicals. Hello, I'm Fiona Thompson and welcome to this edition of RTS Yorkshire Talks. Now for many of us, our idea of firefighting relies on having watched Blue Watch in the drama series London's Burning. Well, a new observational documentary series brings a slap up to date with the reality, and it is set here in glorious Yorkshire. I've seen a couple of the episodes already, and it has great characters and gripping storylines, but it is fundamentally a human story about key workers who risk their lives to keep us safe and to rescue us when danger strikes. Yorkshire Firefighters is made by Leeds-based company Wise Owl Films and is on BBC Two this summer. And of course, it will be available on iPlayer. I'm delighted then to welcome today series producer James Knight, who's joining me to talk about all things firefighting. So hello, hello. James, how are you doing? Uh, I'm great, Fiona. Thanks for having me. Great to meet you. Well, it's great to have you here. And how, how, first of all, how's COVID been, been treating you yourself? <laughs> well, I've spent a lot of time in, in my basement here uh, writing out scripts and uh, having Zoom meetings, I think, like most of us in the industry. So we've 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 sort of vacated the office to a degree, although we've been in in more recently over the last couple of months. But effectively, this series has been made entirely with crews out on location, um, a bit of production management in the office and edits done remotely. So I've never met any of the editors well I've met them separately but never met them on this production and uh, we've run the entire thing from from our homes effectively so it's been a bit strange but kind of satisfying and rewarding as well in, in different ways and, and it, it sort of makes you focus on how um, productions are made I think in a slightly different way and I'm sure everyone in the industry who's gone through this will, will have looked at their processes and thought about how you actually get a, an idea to screen if if you, 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 your face-to-face -face contact's been limited. Yeah, I think that's one of the remarkable things that has come out of this, is it's made us appreciate even more the work that goes on behind the scenes in front of the camera to make sure that programmes still come through to us at a time when we need them more and more. And we'll talk a bit more about that when we go on to the, 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 how the programme actually got made. But how did you get this programme started? So, um, Obviously, like a lot of companies, last summer, uh, spring, summer, we were in a massive development frenzy because a lot of existing commissions had been parked and we were forced to rethink big ideas that involved travel and presenter led stuff. And, and um, we were thinking, you know, what, what is possible to be made, you know, as things sort of start to open up throughout the summer and into the autumn. And um, we, we were looking into um, blue light series because obviously they're a, 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 a perennial favorite particularly on on the beeb you know there's a lot of great series out there with the police and you know with the likes of ambulance as well very very carefully crafted uh, documentary that, that reveal a little bit more about those those jobs and and we sort of noted that the the firefighters um, sort of strands hadn't uh, hadn't been as prevalent of late and and we noticed some statistics and some campaigns that were being run by um, various forces across the country various services that they're trying to increase diversity and and um, female participation in the job and we just thought you know that's a really interesting angle to come at a traditionally white male profession frankly you know across across um through history you know and, and so we sort of in, loosely made inquiries to a few forces uh, services near us because we thought start on our doorstep because you know with covid in mind you know where better to um make a series than, than on your own doorstep so we approached west yorkshire fire and rescue and and they were pretty amenable to the idea because they liked our angle, which was to sort of tell the stories of the younger members of the team, the female firefighters. We noted they've got a, I think they had a 6% uh, 
um, female uh, uh, makeup of their workforce and, and they were trying to increase that and are trying to increase that and we, we, we sort of said to them look you know who are these great young female firefighters coming through you know let's make a film about what they do in, in, a, in a very male dominated world and they were interested and we went to um, Ashley and O'Connor's department is BBC England so that they have commissioning power um, for BBC One and Two outside of London um, and she was interested and we we worked with her and Tony Parker who's a Leeds based uh, commissioning editor and they basically said look you know if you can get the access we, we'd be interested in a, a co-production and to, uh, Patrick Holland will take it on BBC Two Network. So that was sort of the, the deal, really, um, uh, you know, run out of BBC England, which is brilliant because, you know, we had a commissioning editor on our doorstep and the access looked good. And, and so by sort of late summer, we were, we were in the point where we were trying to plan for how it could happen for the budget and, you know, schedule. So that, that's when we got into all the protocols and the actual nuts and bolts of how how we would make it yeah and uh, am i am i right in thinking that that uh, i mean wise owls is well established uh, now within within the, the region yeah. uh, but doing this sort of observational documentary is relatively new to it so so how did you pull together a team because obviously it's, this is quite a specialist area yeah, and um, well, we'd made uh, a series for ITV um, on the on the Metro train service up in the northeast, which is uh, four half hours uh, in the Obdock space. But you know, like you say, you know, blue blue light series are a, a bit of a level apart, really, um, mainly because of the pressures put on the filmmakers, the compliance pressures. Uh, the access into dangerous situations it just requires um a, a lot of thinking really before you go ahead with it so so we we staffed it up with uh, people that mark and i uh, mark robinson the creative director uh, and, and i knew um who, who who'd had a track record on working on similar shows so we ben sheldon was brought in as um series director and he's worked uh, on ambulance and various other um fairly high-end um, self-shot series where, where where you've got compliance issues every minute at every turn and, and, and risks. And um, a, a PD called Hannah Blackwell, who, uh, again, she just come straight from hospital, which she'd filmed through the early days of COVID. You know, she had um, been fully gowned up and masked up inside um, COVID wards in London hospitals. So we knew she was you know more than up to it um and then we we, we pulled in uh, ap's as well who who were also experienced in, in that area so we, we we were careful we streamlined our teams because um the access was very very dependent on us being able to fit around the protocols the fire service had in place so i'll, I'll just tell you very briefly how it works you know the the fire service have a shift pattern uh, which is four days on and four days off. So you, you effectively live with your watch, uh, as they're called, you know, green watch, red watch, blue watch, white watch, all, all alternate on a shift pattern. So we decided the best way to make this authentic was to have our teams effectively become part of a watch for an entire shift pattern. So they call it a tour, a four day tour. So it's two day shifts and then two night shifts. And so in order to do that, um, we needed our teams to be very, very streamlined and, and able to hit the ground. So, you, you know, they would join the, the crew at the beginning of a shift and work for four days with them. They'd rig all the cameras. We had GoPros in the fire engine. We had helmet cameras on the uh, certain firefighters. And then we had the main FX9 camera with the the 50 mil lens, which we use, which was the main camera. So quite a small setup. But in order to do that, we, we had to be very careful that our film teams didn't interact with anyone else, really, because particularly in the early days, you know, we were under another lockdown, if you remember, back in November when we started filming. So any positive COVID test or, or in a family member or on a team member or with one of the firefighters, it, it leads to fairly catastrophic knock-on effects because everyone has to isolate. 
So it was very important that our teams were very self-contained. They didn't, I didn't meet them very often. You know, the production manager didn't, they stayed apart. They only stayed in their family bubbles and then they went to work. Um, and so they fitted around that shift pattern and, and we effectively worked with the fire service to um, segue into their structure really. So across West Yorkshire, I think there are 40 stations um, and we had access to six of the main ones um, with a particular watch on each station. So we got to know certain characters. So we had three stations in Leeds. We had Leeds main station, we had Killingbeck and we had Hunslet. And then over in Bradford, we had the main station. And then we also had Huddersfield and Dewsbury. So it gave us a really good cross section of West Yorkshire, allowed us to see the variety of work that the fire service do and also um, a bit of geographical um, vary, variability as well to show off the, the landscape and, and the characters. So what, once that was up and running, we effectively planned a month ahead and decided, you know, this team are gonna be with Dewsbury for these shifts and then they'll be with Bradford for these shifts. And, and the, pre the press office and us between us decided, you know, that, that a month, uh, we were sort of a month ahead. And then we just had to hope we got lucky you know, with the jobs that came in. You know, I was going to say to you, it's, it's, it's unpredictable. I mean, when you watch things like Ambulance, they've got continual churn going on with, 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 with activities. But obviously with the fire service, it is unpredictable. So what did you do in terms of that, to manage that unpredictability, both in terms of that being available, which you, you've obviously just talked about, but also getting the balance of filming right between emergencies and station-based activities? Well, um, we were in the lap of the gods to a degree, but what, what we realised was, um, weirdly, the, the, quiet, the quiet time, as it were, around the station yielded some of the best material because what we always wanted this to be, and I, and I hope, hope you found when you viewed, is it's a more authentic and intimate portrayal of a job that perhaps the public don't fully understand uh, what, what firefighters do i mean we had a few stats in there you know they i think they used to i might be wrong on this it was a, a, about uh two-thirds of their jobs used to be fighting fires and that's dropped right down nowadays because uh, effectively their campaigns have been successful smoke alarms um you know improvements in building practices escape routes that sort of thing you know it's very rare people get trapped in burning buildings thankfully these days and you know hence why terrible incidents like grenfell you know which we touch on are, are incredibly rare um so we realized that the firefighters role is a lot more diverse and um varied than you might imagine and 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 what we found was that over a four-day period yes there may be two or three call outs which involved putting a fire out there might be a, a we had a couple of house fires we had loads of car fires uh you know arson that sort of thing but weirdly a fire is relatively interesting but if there's nobody in the building and everyone's safe and it's just something on fire they, they put that out pretty quick it takes maybe a minute what's interesting is the thought process and the the, the thinking that goes into prioritizing it you know are they worried there's somebody there or missing are they worried that it could spread to neighboring buildings and we, we learned about the technicalities of that but also we we learned about the other roles really that they that, that they um they cover there's a lot of what they call ambulance assist um jobs so for instance we have a very um, interesting story in one of the episodes where a, a, an elderly chap's broken his leg and he's stuck upstairs in his, his flat, but the paramedics can't get in. Um, they've been called by a neighbour who think they've heard him crying out for help. And um, so the firefighters turn up and their job is to, you know, break in, then work out um, how to get him out down these stairs along with the paramedics. And you see a much more community fronted um, side to the job I think and we learn a bit more about the characters uh, of the firefighters themselves when they're these more human facing jobs and um, we see them do what they call safe and well visits where they visit vulnerable people in their community and just you know have a cup of tea with them change a smoke alarm talk to them you know sometimes 
these individuals hadn't seen anyone for several months really other than on um fo phone calls or quick word with a neighbor so there's there's a real um lovely sort of human level appreciation you get of them and then of course there's the time at the station you, which feels really privileged that access it was you know we, we spent meal times with them we learned about the history of the service you know they showed us the old bar where they would drink in the 90s and 80s you know can you imagine now you know and play snooker those old cliches you know some of the old stations still have those rooms and the younger firefighters are baffled that they <laughs> might have spent a friday night having four pints and a game of snooker but that did used to happen and it's it's interesting to hear the older guys reminiscing about that and being proud of the youngsters coming through the young female firefighters that are making their way the the young lad, local lads who are, you know treading in the footsteps of their their um their father sometimes so there was a lot of that um broadening of the role and i think sometimes with blue light series and this is definitely evolving but it, it, it latter in the past i think you would just see the the actual characters as a just a conduit to tell the story whereas perhaps the other way around a bit here the characters come first and the stories just give them that hero status that we all know that they deserve so it, it was much felt much um, it was much more of a privilege to spend the quiet time with them as well as the, the busy time hello <laughs> Hiya Jess, are you all right? I'm a mum, I'm a partner, um, you know, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, but I come here and I'm, I'm all of those in a way, I, I bring them all together and that what, that's what makes me really good at my job. Yeah, are you just ringing to say night? Yes, and also I'm ringing to say that they stay. Oh, thank you, darling. I will say safe. Uh, is that for, is that for green, the rest of Green Watch as well? Yeah, I love you. I love you too. I do love my job. I still get that buzz when the bells go down and uh, we get a fire call. See you in the morning. Night, Night darling. Bye. Thanks Night. for ringing. Bye. Night. Thanks for ringing. Bye. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye, Bye darling. Bye. Bye. <laughs> And having watched a couple of the programmes and thoroughly loved them, I mean, they're, they're really good. I agree with you about the, 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 the their character led. And we, but we also follow, I think, is it Lauren in the final, in, the, in, the, in one of the episodes I watched that she was going through her first, her, she'll come to the end of her first year and being tested on a lot of, a lot of things in order to actually pass her probation. And I won't do, give any spoilers, but watching all that she was going through but it, was, it wasn't just all the technical things that I was, I was i was thinking oh my gosh i've got to do all that all the planning and everything when they're out at a, at, at a, a situation uh, but it was also the support and i think that's what came through from both the episodes i watched was the terrific camaraderie the support the laughter uh, and 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 the fun and that and that was described by both the um the men and the women they both felt that, that that teamwork, that camaraderie, and of course that's very important. I want to go back because I mean you, you talked about you know not so many fires these days, but of course in one of the episodes you uh, you cover the big fire that we had over here in Bradford, the big tire fire, um, which gave with some compelling images. I mean the the, the, the what, the, what the camera picked up, but also yeah. quite scary. Yeah, it was. I mean, that was um, pretty early on, actually, in our um, in our schedule. We were really finding our feet. I think it was sort of mid late November. It happened, um, and Ben, the series director, and I were chatting because uh, how it worked was we, we we would have obviously have automatic access to any incident where our we were on the shoulder of a crew, but that incident started overnight, and we didn't happen to be filming with anyone as it kicked off so we were on shift with somebody the following morning at Leeds um, and we were chatting and we spoke with the press office and the press office said look you know it's 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 really dangerous so we're going to have to be careful getting you behind the cordon at the moment and then we got it cleared so the great news was we could get down to site much closer than any other members of the media within probably 
four or five hours of, of us knowing about the fire and uh, Ben went down there with, with Natalie the AP working with him and um, we immediately had latched onto a couple of characters who we knew and got fire cam helmet cameras we use these little um, approved cameras which work in very high heat and a lot of the helmet cam footage you see is uh, captured by those and it was quite a pretty important little piece of kit really because all the areas we couldn't go with the camera that 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 could um yeah and 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 i think the decision to use um speaking a bit technically and geeky for a while but we, we the decision to use a um a, a prime lens uh, across the whole series the, the we use the the new sony fx9 camera with with um with a 50 mil lens so the whole thing was shot with this one lens and when you have a low light light situation so it's dark but you've got very intense coloring like you do with a fire it becomes very cinematic and the depth of field and ben fortunately could get get in quite close to the burning tires um a lot alongside the firefighters and some of that materials pretty pretty powerful and i think what we did hopefully quite well with that story is we we, we, we investigated the anatomy of um, how the fire service tackle a big incident and how it puts pressure on the wider service. So we meet the ladies in control who have to move fire engines and fire cover around in order to have 100 firefighters in Bradford. There are fewer firefighters elsewhere. I mean, there are only eight or 900 in the whole county. So you've got one in seven or eight of them in one place with all the biggest you know the the uh, aerial platforms as well and um, suddenly you, you stretched and as we saw there were a few other incidents happened around that time which pulled them in 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 other directions so seeing that behind the scenes um decision making and how the um the tactical battle between fire and firefighter plays out i found quite fascinating and obviously that that story forms kind of the backbone of that episode um, so we were in in some ways Bradford was unfortunate, but we we were fortunate that that happened and and nobody was hurt thankfully and it it, it was ended ended safely. But it it was a huge story and we were right at the heart of it. Yeah, it's it's the way these things happen sometimes, isn't it? It's it's kind of a, a bad luck, good luck that, exactly. that, that happens. But when you talk about the, the cameras, because I know some people are, are really fascinated by this sort of thing, including myself, is that. Actually, the technology that allows us to have the GoPros and the helmet cameras, and sometimes you, 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 you're not sure which camera you're seeing through, but that technology actually must be useful for, for doing these kind of observational yeah, it, documentaries. It was, yeah. I mean, this is very much Ben's baby, and, and he, he came up with this plan, you know, the, the, to, to, to create this look. And, yeah, I mean, particularly as we only had two 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 person teams on the ground there was a lot of responsibility those guys did a good job is if you imagine at the start of a shift um you're you you, you know you're there at the service at, uh, at 7 a.m or whatever you've got four gopros to rig on the fight the main fire engine you've got two or three helmet cameras to put on the correct helmets check all the batteries check all the cards and then we had various microphones all over the place because obviously the main camera only records audio to two channels um which would be the contributors you you're filming whether it's members of the public or firefighters that you, you you're focusing on but all the rest of them those with the helmet cameras on they need isolated microphones they needed uh, we need to have microphone inside the fire engine because covid regulations meant we couldn't travel with the firefighters this is why we rigged the fire engines with gopros we we were always in a follow vehicle which was driven by the watch commander in a um right behind so you see that vehicle occasionally you know sophie drives it and steve drives it to to, to big incidents and uh, so the boss always has the white helmet on that's how you know and the film crew have the red helmets on and the firefighters have the yellow helmets um so uh yeah the, the, that may meant for a very very technically challenging wrangling process so again bit, bit technical but at the end of every day our, our dit our d d data um, wrangler would have to round up all the rushes allocate certain audio rushes to certain helmet cameras and name them 
uh, and then mix. And then obviously there was the FX9 rushes as well. And they would all get sent to edit where I, I, I was running the edit remotely from home because we were editing si simultaneous to the shoots. So um, that I mean, I'm sure you'll we'll, we'll get on to this in, in a sec, but the structuring of the episodes was almost dictated by uh, what material was coming in initially. We would originally initially cut stories. So as an incident would happen and we were comfortable, we had the right consent and, you know, the, the members of the public had signed and we had, you know, the right permissions to use the, uh, the story. Uh, that, that that would go down the line and the editors would start story cutting them and bringing in the the audio and the GoPros and everything. And 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 before long, you'd have a maybe a 10 minute pull of a story, which I could then work into a script. So it became a production line, really, as we were still filming. And it meant that Hannah and Ben could story produce as they went, because, for instance, you know, there's a had a low Lauren story in episode four. We We, we needed her to be involved in in some incidents you know and Hunslet you know we needed them to have some jobs so what we would do is we'd restructure our filming plan so that we'd spend more time with Hunslet near the end just in the hope we'd get work that would involve Lauren so you're trying to box off your stories um, as well as capturing all the big incidents that were happening so it was a bit of a juggling act whilst the edit was running alongside the the, the filming that's one of the tricky things, isn't it? When you're character led, you've got to let their story develop. And so I presume that, that means then that, that, that you were editing sequences of uh, when they were out on uh, attending a call, etc. And then thinking, OK, how do we make this all, all work up? Because I know that in the, fir in the first episode I saw, uh, you've got one of the firefighters, she starts off the episode and she's got she's got hair <laughs> and then suddenly she she talks to us and she hasn't got hair and you're thinking okay and then part way through we understand why where the yeah hair. that it's was a beautiful, that, it's a beautiful oh sequence goodness, Sarah's, you're thinking, okay <laughs> Sarah's hair was uh quite a challenge for us we could we knew she was going to get it shaved and then um when it the timing couldn't have been any worse because it was right after a really big job that we wanted potentially to include later in the episode so it was we had to really think that one through but I think the way it reveals halfway through sort of makes everyone go oh I get it I understand yeah. now um, yeah no it's, yeah. it's lovely <laughs> but um, no, it, it was very challenging that actually. And I would say in terms of overall challenges of the series, that was the number one uh, head headache for me um, because um, you realise very quickly a BBC hour is very long and it sounds odd thing to say, but 58 minutes is very different to a commercial hour of 46 with ad breaks in it. And, and, and they're much more like a proper film almost they're, they're really chunky and you can't just meander through story after story or you run out of steam so you have to be able to revisit a character later on in the hour with a bit of an evolution of their story and so what we had to very carefully do probably from about late January February onwards when the filming was winding down and we were filming all our drone shots and our pickups of the fire engines and the pretty shots you know that look nice and the master interviews and everything um, we had to carefully think about what stories would fit where and, and, and episode one we were fortunate in that we had bonfire night period which was set in stone we had this tire fire was set in stone around that time around November and that almost carried the whole episode we needed a few more incidents in there just to fill that out but then the other episodes became a lot more thematic um we we, we focused in on community we focused in on um you know what it's like to live in tower blocks and what that means for residents and we touched on post Grenfell and um and, and that was a good way into dealing with you know the community outreach work that firefighters do and then we we looked at rookies you know we we tell lauren's story as coming through as a young female firefighter and simon's story which is an episode you, you know you've not seen and he's a young lad from dewsbury who's becomes a driver uh, for a fire engine driver and it's a great little story and he has a brilliant payoff uh, and then we also touch on covid and, and mental health which in the episode you saw and I think that's some of the more powerful material really when you, you hear a, a guy in his 30s 
talking kind of candidly about how hard life has been for people, not just the people they help, but the firefighters themselves, you know, and how lucky they are to do a job which allows them to be around their friends every day and, and, and their family. And they, they realize it's been a privilege for them. And as Kelly says at the start, you know, no one expected to live through a global pandemic and it's 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 affected everyone in in in, a, in different ways and and i think the viewers hopefully will take heart in the um the positivity that comes out from them and it's quite nice watching a load of mates eating a meal together and laughing and joking and cooking a curry or whatever they're doing and just thinking yeah that's a bit of normality a bit of escapism and uh, so we were really proud to be able to capture that because it felt like it was a slice of life that not none of us were getting at that point. Yeah, that's true. And I, I mean, it, it, it has some really great emotional movements that really, that really grab you. Uh, but also I was very jealous of some of the food I saw they were having, although the alarm did seem to go off regularly when they were about to sit down to a nice... That did, gen that did genuinely breakfast, happen. You know? and that genuinely yeah. happened about three times, particularly the, the funniest... Uh, you don't see it actually. This is one of the other shows that you've not seen yet, but it happens in Huddersfield where Mo, Mo one of the firefighters, has just created one of his masterpiece curries and it, it the bell goes literally as they're sitting down it, it, it's, it's, it's good but yeah there were lots of funny there's a lot of humor in there as well and I, I, I hope people watch it and think you've captured the, the sort of character a little bit because some of the the the, the back and forth like the bit about the cat in the fire engine it's it, it, it's it's proper Yorkshire down-to-earth humor uh, on a uh, you know uh, not on a it's not contrived or forced it's just them being themselves and we were really really keen to capture that and I think some of the firefighters actually forgot they were being filmed at times and and when they watched the episodes back they were really laughing at the thought that those daft conversations were, were making the final cut but that's what viewers take away they, they want to warm to the characters and we very we were very careful not to overload the cast as well because if you've got too many people popping up all the time, you'll you probably noted, you know, in the episodes, there's generally three or four main characters whose stories carry it, but all their colleagues are there as well. So otherwise, you you, you forget who's who. They all look the same with the, the visors on and everything. It's quite hard sometimes to to remember what's going on and who's said what. <laughs> so so the fire service, they they like what they saw. Yeah, they did. And I think they felt that um it was showing off the job in a way that they'd not seen before. Um, you know, it, 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 it removed some of the cliches perhaps around the job and actually was, a, I would like to think, a very good sales pitch for, that, for their, their aim to encourage people who perhaps hadn't thought of joining the fire service as a job as something that they might consider because there are a lot of positives to it. I mean, it's not... Let's be honest, it's it's a tough job for your home life balance because you you work nights, you know, you you miss weekends all the time. It's definitely a tough job. And it's it's frankly, it's quite dangerous. You know, sometimes they go into dangerous situations and the, the watch commanders have to make life or death decisions, genuinely do on a weekly basis, you know. So th there's that, but but the the satisfaction they seem to derive from the job is is really palpable when when, when you spend time with them. Yeah, you know, I think you've given a, a, a great a great uh, presentation advert or whatever for for the Yorkshire firefighters and for Yorkshire as well actually because the Yorkshire side of it comes through that humour and that compassion and that care uh, comes through very strongly. Now I've always wondered with programs like this because uh, you know like with ambulance and hospital etc that you're going into these situations and you're filming people and then you've got to gain, gain consent and do all the compliance afterwards. How does that actually work and and how many people turn around and say you've got to be joking no way. <laughs> Well, it, it does occasionally happen, but virtually every, every uh, virtually every time you 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 manage to to secure it. I mean, it's it's a bit different to a police series where you've got um, a lot more criminality on screen. So we do blur. There are there are blurrings in 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 the episodes, but not so many. They're mainly for people who are 
unrelated to the scene or had chosen not to be included and so we we, we make sure they're non-identifiable but basically yeah i mean it started with the protocols at the very very beginning with the fire service because effectively our helmet cameras are going into people's property without them knowing at the very start you know there's no getting around that you know the beginning of an incident much as you're outside going hello we're the bbc we're filming this you know people are shocked as what's happening to their house or whatever and and, and you have to obviously respect whatever they say at that point and usually they were saying look fine just get on with it we just want the fire putting out and and the, the filmmaker's job was to reassure anyone there that we were just following the firefighters doing their job and we will talk to them properly at the right moment to secure proper consent and so that protocol was very carefully set and worded because the fire service's reputation is at stake as much as the BBC's with this and and, and Wiesel films you know you you don't want to be wading in filming stuff without um people understanding or or, or being happy with it if it's private property so we we, we were very careful at the time and then su subsequently I, I we had a producer Al Alison who worked alongside me throughout and her job was to follow up with all, all, all the incidents and speak to the um, the people involved, you know, get the right paperwork signed and make sure they were happy um, that the material we were going to include is, is, is not going to be too traumatic for them. And funnily enough, this morning I've been calling around contributors, letting them know, uh, you know, when the show is going to be on, you know, so you, you've got that standard duty of care, which I think television these days is, is a lot better at you know than it, than it used to be we, we we understand now people you know with phones and everything gets filmed there's social media there's so much information is shared all the time and the least we can do is make sure the people who were included in the show are happy and, and understand and so the, the it, it was a, an evolving process really like there were some incidents that involve criminality uh, you, you know there's a, a couple of drug um dens that we that have small fires in them and there are no individuals shown but obviously there you've got more of a uh, a defense in the, the sort of public interest defense to be filming inside a property where uh criminality has taken place because you know you, you're exposing an illegal activity which could have led to a f house burning down and it could have affected neighbors so where where the, the incidents like that occurred we were, we were on safer ground but we just had a very solid process with our lawyers bbc editorial policy um and and, and, and also our experience you know as producers understanding how to handle contributors understanding what might be traumatic to people um, and showing the material at times if it was the right thing to do um, but we're fortunate you know none of the incidents resulted in in any um, fatalities which you know sadly does happen from time to time and I, I imagine the guys on the likes of hospital and ambulance have an even tougher job when they have to handle stories like that you know it's that that aftercare never really ends I don't think with a, with a story like that yeah and you mentioned duty of care there, and I think uh, one of the sides of that is duty of care for the uh, for the film crew as well, who are going into dangerous situations, as you say, potentially fatal sometimes, uh, and, and luckily not for them this time. But uh, how did uh, it, how did you and Wise Owls uh, support your? Well, your yeah, at the, at the beginning we had. Um some training you know the guys we, we actually all got issued fire kit for a start you know like jackets and helmets so uh, the, the, they spent a day training with the fire service so they understood how to behave at incidents and the chain of command and uh, so the safety side of things along allied with their own experience of dealing with you know road roadside incidents and um uh you know other serious incidents with the police and the the paramedics had stood them in good stead on that front but um the aftercare i mean i i, I just we're lucky that wise owl uh, the parent company is lime uh, pictures who um obviously you know uh, run some very big shows you know like towie and um you know geordie shaw which involve sort of multiple contributors with potential um duty of care issues so they're very very robust and they have an excellent um 
support system you know run from the very top so producers can always go direct to them for for counseling or for for a conversation or for a referral if they need to and i made sure i checked in with the guys as well often as as did mark um because they were they were difficult hours as well for the film crew they, they worked a sort of four day week but but you've had very disrupted sleep you've been sleeping on the floor of a fire station you've been getting up at 3 a.m to go to jobs it, it's a, it's a, it was a tough job for them and so we just made sure that they were you know getting enough rest and they were they were seeing their families enough and if they had seen or experienced anything traumatic that they knew that they could talk talk to us about it and 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 talk to a professional if needed it, it as as you say thankfully there there were there were not so many really harrowing scenes but there were definitely emotionally challenging scenes to shoot and they handled them with great experience and and um, professionalism but I, I suspect afterwards they had you know had to go home and unwind a bit and it, it, it was a there's, there's no denying these kind of shows are not easy for the, the people who make them, which is probably why they the filmmakers tend to move from this kind of thing to something a bit more sedate for a while and then might go back and work in a hospital for six months because you become utterly uh, um, and wrapped up by the world that you're inhabiting. That's how you get the characters to open up. That's how you get the stories. And that's what the guys did on this. But I'd like to think they've come out of it relatively unscathed, we hope. <laughs> well, that's, that's good to know and good to know about the care that's there. Now, uh, you mentioned about them having to sleep on the floor of a, a fire station. Well, you know, you've slept in a cave in Vietnam as part of your television career. Uh, so what got you from sleeping in a cave in Vietnam to to Wise Isle and working on this? What's your kind of background? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that was certainly a um, it was it a high or a low moment? I don't know. Um, no, I started off um, uh, as a trainee at BBC Current Affairs in Manchester uh, in the early part of the millennium, or should I say, you know, the early two thousands. Um, so I did a postgrad course before that in broadcast journalism. So started off in shows like Panorama and things like that as a researcher, and then ended up doing more. Um, specialist factual as I, as I went through the years and because I, I got a degree in um, environmental science so I sort of always enjoyed science shows and you know natural history and history stuff so I, I worked for Granada factuals as, as was um, for a good few years in, in the, the mid part of the 2000s and did a lot of work for Discovery for National Geographic for History Channel when they used to make programs for international broadcasters um, so I was very lucky to travel a lot and film down gold mines and as you say in the world's biggest cave in Vietnam we did a nine-day expedition there for Nat Geo with a load of guys who were measuring the size of the cave but because it was so isolated once we were in we were in and there was just no way of calling anyone or doing anything you're in the dark um, so that that was proper you know old-fashioned uh, exploration documentary making and you learn a lot but for the fundamentals of making any program are the same no matter where you're doing it you need the right people the right kit the right script and plan and you need to be agile enough to adapt to problems that come along so you you know you learn from shows like that and and then I had a good few years doing children's tv for BBC children's in Manchester um, working on shows like um, the, the show called The Dengineers, which is on at the moment, which is very popular with eight and nine year olds. You know, it was a sort of makeover show for kids building them an amazing den. And then I did another thing with um, Dick and Dom, who are great, great presenters, who we, we did a, a thing about how um, how the massive engineering works. So we went all over the place filming big bridges and things and then ended up um, doing some more stuff for Nat Geo and then got talking to Mark about um, coming into his newish company and, and, and working up um, specialist factual ideas and some uh, big engineering stuff, some of which we were very close to making actually before COVID hit. Um, and then this this commission came along and I was working on the development and because I'd done quite a bit of ob doc uh, during my time at ITV, it felt like a good fit. So it but it's been a learning experience. I mean, I've never 
really been tested um, structurally and script wise as much as this series. I mean, it was, it, they are tough. And, and I think anyone who's done long form Obdoc will tell you it's, it's, it's right up there for technical uh, stress. But I think the rewards are there if you can pull off a, a good film. Yeah, well, I congratulate you and your team because uh, from what I've seen, uh, and I watch a lot of these Obdocs, it, it's up there with the, with, with the best of them. And I hope everybody who is listening to this goes out and watches them and, and sees how wonderful they are and sees what Yorkshire firefighters are actually dealing with and the characters that we see there. So I, I really hope you get a recommission. I hope that it goes down really, really well. And uh, thank you so much for talking to us today. And uh, you, yeah, I hope soon pleasure. to be able to see you properly. Yeah, in person, that would be lovely. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. All uh, right, it's great. Thanks a lot. Take okay. care. Bye-bye. Bye I'm 47 years old, and I've been in the West Yorkshire Fire Rescue Service for 20 years now. Spinach, chicks, peppers, mango chutney. Them naan breads need to be nuked. My dad came in in the early 60s as a migrant worker. He worked for 33 years in a mill, uh, worked hard for a living. So, uh, you know, oh, I'm born and bred here, a proud Yorkshireman. Who's put peas in curry? Not me. Good dog. There's always no, bloody no, one in there. Okay. I'm not happy about that. Who likes peas? More. He is a local lad. He lives a stone throw from station. Have you thrown peas in curry? He is a bit like the station cat. He's, he's always here. Even when he's off duty, he's popping in. Can we get ten plates out, then? As an Asian man, you let the brotherhood down by not being able to make a curry. You have to be able to make a curry, man. <laughs> My mum won't let me. There's not many Asian firefighters in our communities. Still a white male dominated service. It's really important that we get more into the job. Because a lot of our communities, you know, they, 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 sometimes they might be reluctant to let people through the doors. And so when Asian communities see an Asian face, black communities see a black face, uh, uh, it, it kind of may, maybe makes them feel a, a bit more comfortable to allow us to do our prevention work. You know, getting the smoke alarms up because these are the, 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 the things that can save lives at the end of the day. Quantity, they used to say, and not quality, but I believe in both. Tell you what, I should be a chef for me, shouldn't I? That's it. Ooh, ready for this. Yeah. Oh, no! Nightmare. What is it? Bin fire. It won't take long. <laughs>